Halito, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native cultures, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And stay tuned for the end of each episode, where we'll talk about some great ways to support Native causes and or Native-owned businesses. Let's get started. But first, a word from our sponsor. The Choctaw Nation has always provided a foundation upon which a future can be built. From our home in Southeast Oklahoma to a bingo hall that grew to be one of the largest casinos in the world. Today's summer school programs lay the groundwork for a love of learning. Small business programs support local economies. And with over 10,000 jobs created, Choctaw offers financial stability to tribal members and our neighbors. Together we build success because together we're more. My guest today is a dear friend and someone I used to serve on the board with a few years back at the American Indian Center of Indiana. This man gives so much and he is highly respected as an elder in the Native American community. So let's get right to it. Thank you, Leroy, for visiting with me today and Holly Toe to you. In my opener, I may have accidentally left out the part that you're one of the best storytellers that I know. Sometimes in the board meetings, you'd start to tell a story and I'd think it was very serious and true. And then you'd give us a twist at the end and it was actually a joke. I eventually caught on more as I got to know you. But there are parts of your own story that are very true and actually are in parts very serious. But I love your positive attitude. So let's hear more about your life story. What tribe are you from, and tell us what your name means. Well, first off, my name is Leroy Malater. I was named by my father. Leroy meaning the king, and Malater meaning the badland. So a lot of times I refer to myself as the king of the badland. <laughs> That's kind of a, a nice noble name to have, Leroy. Well, I enjoy using it. <laughs> uh, uh, people call me the king or the king of the badland. It's kind of fun. Yeah. If anyone messes with you, you can just say, hey, do you know who I am? I'm the king of the Badlands. I referred to myself as the Romantical Indian, but I had to stop that. Uh, It wasn't too romantic over the last few years. So, well, I'll just skip that and go right to (laughs) the Roy Malater. Oh, yeah. You're talking about when you you had COVID not too long ago, right? I had COVID before they knew there was COVID. And uh, it knocked me down for a couple of months at least, maybe a little more. I, I was pretty sick. I got very short-winded, and I had a very rough time. I'm okay now. I'm taking physical therapy, and I'm getting a lot stronger, and I want to go back to ballroom dancing. Good. And we're definitely going to talk about your ballroom dancing today, too. I I know that uh, you're kind of known for that, as well as a lot of other things in the powwow. So so you are Chippewa, and uh, you were born in North Dakota, correct? I was born in North Dakota. My ancestry came from Canada, and uh, that's kind of a sad story because they were not white and they were not Indian. They were half-breeds. That's a derogatory term, and, well, uh, there was an old chief. He was a Chippewa chief, and he felt sorry for us. He said, these people have no, they have no people. They have no culture. I'm going to adopt them. So we were adopted by this Chippewa chief and put into his tribe. We we liked that. We enjoyed being Chippewa. We really didn't know the culture, but we learned as we went along. And uh, then we were put on the... Well, we, we weren't put on that reservation. We went... To, my, my ancestry just settled there at that reservation where Father Belcourt started that and teaching people. And that's where our reservation got started. And we didn't practice Indian culture very much. We... We were all Catholic. We had no choice but to be Catholic. And that's the way I grew up in the, in the Catholic Church. We never spoke our Indian language. The true Indian Mati language is so mixed up. It's got you know, French, Chippewa, Cree, probably a little German and Celtic. It, it's got a lot of different uh, words. But it's a funny thing. If you go to to the reservation, you can talk to everyone. One of them might talk to you... Uh, to the other one in French or Cree, and they'll speak to English in English to you, and you speak English to them. They'll know what it is, but they'll answer somebody else in Cree. 
So it, it, it's a good language. It, it's complete. It's, a lot of people have come to the reservation to study that language. Well, I'm kind of proud of it now. I, I was told it was a, not a good language at all, but now I appreciate it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Because I, when I was looking up, researching more about the Chippewa, that was one of the things that I thought was beautiful about the Chippewa is, is their language, which is just this culmination, like you said, of all these different, you know, Celtic and German mm-hmm. and French and Cree. So, and it kind of sets you apart. There are some uh, similar native languages out there that are such a culmination, but a lot of them are, oh, it's two or three tribal languages put together. And, and this is really such a melting pot. And so you mentioned growing up on a reservation, and what was the name of that reservation? Our reservation was the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation, Belcourt, North Dakota. And like I said, it was founded by Father Belcourt. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the teachers and stuff, they were all non-Indian. The teachers and superintendents and the business people were white. Toward the last, we were getting more Indian people in as teachers and, and good education, so that was a big improvement. Wow. And for our listeners, remember that name Belcourt because it's a big part of Leroy's story, actually, uh, as far as his family history goes. So there's more to that. So I remember, Leroy, when we were talking the other day, you mentioned how when you were younger, you wanted to be white. And now, obviously, you're a very proud Chippewa native. But at the time, you mentioned how if native people could pass as white people, they would have because of just the times, you know, back then. Well, that that certainly is true, uh, because uh, especially in the history books, we read about history, and we were always such bad people. If we won a fight, we were just massacred. It, it was yeah. never a good fight, because everybody that fought the Indians and won, they had great victories. They were great heroes, you know. We had no one to really look up to, according to our history books. And so we wanted to be white. We wanted to pass for white if we could. And this is a, a sad story. About 1954... They opened the liquor to Indian people mm-hmm. so we could have liquor on our reservation. I'd say that didn't really help anything. Before, we used to have to lie and say we were white to buy alcohol. Well, I didn't. I was too young. But whoever wanted to buy alcohol had to lie and try to pass for white. Of course, when they opened it up, then it didn't make any difference. But the, the whole thing was bad because when you had to buy liquor and lie about it, then you had to drink it on a sly so you'd buy liquor and you drink it pretty fast uh, hmm. before you got caught with it. <laughs> wow. It's just a crazy thought that, you know, we thankfully live in a generation now where everyone is just proud of their Indian heritage or, yes, or at least are. most are, you know, and definitely you've seen a lot of changes over the years, I would assume, because of things like that. Well, the younger people were getting into their Indian heritage and, and I could like that when I went back to the reservation after I lived here a while, I, I was very happy to see that some of them were interested and they were asking me a lot of questions about Indian stuff. And wow. They're learning the tradition. But we had what we called Les Sauvage, the savages. Mm. We referred to them as the savages, and they were the ones, always, a lot of them referred to as full bloods. They kept their Indian heritage, and they'd hold powwows, but they had to hide up in the hills to have their powwows. Wow. And when the police found out about it, they'd go up there and they'd bust it all up and or they'd ruin uh, feathers and headdresses and Indian clothes. That stuff was probably 100 years old and they just destroyed it and burned it up, put a lot of them in jail. We were not allowed to practice our Indian culture until later, until later years. I'm talking about the 40s and probably the 50s, but now it's, uh, they have their powwows and sun dances and it's really good. I'm very, very proud to be sitting here with you today and hearing all of these pieces of information about your life, and I know we'll be digging more into it. And actually, let's do that. So you mentioned to me that you had gone to public school and you were pretty active in sports, football, basketball, softball, and track, and then you went on to serve the Army. So thank you for your service in the Army, and tell us more about your time in the military. When I first went in the Army, I was... uh... Oh, I was probably a, a little bit afraid. I didn't know what to expect. I had three brothers in World War II. They were all airborne, so I signed up for airborne. And I went through basic training okay, and I, I didn't do too bad in jump school, but I floated along pretty good. I was drinking all the time. I, I was a heavy drinker about all the time in the military. I was uh, in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, 
most of that was training exercises, but then I got sent to Vietnam in 65. There, they liked to call on me because they, being Indian, they thought I could see more, which was not really true. I mean, we had the same training, and but I went along with it. I went ahead and went on the patrols and stuff. They, they kept me pretty busy. Yeah. But I didn't mind that. I, I wanted to do my share. Well, I got out of Vietnam and put my time in there, and I went training troops for go and putting them through basic training and their advanced training. Then I got put in a leadership school, a drill instructor school. I became a drill instructor, and I had a good time there. I, I taught physical training. Just about everywhere I went, I had to teach physical training, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed physical training. I enjoyed running, and I had quite a name for that. Then I left there, and I, that's when I went to Vietnam. All in all, I, I had a good stretch in the military. That's great. And so, again, thank you for your service. And you had mentioned to me at one point that a lot of times in the patrols, they wanted Native Americans to be in the group because they thought that they could see better than others or something like that. Yes, right? that's, that's true. They always they go on patrols. And after a while, I was getting a little bit tired of it because uh, you know, night after night on patrol, it, it gets a little bit old after a while. Plus, uh, it was taking me away from my party. And <laughs> right, right. I did like to drink a little them days. And it sounds like the second part of that story is that you did get clean at one point, and that was a big game changer in your life. And, um, you know, I, I also I was thinking about you had told me at one point that, you know, the movies had a lot to do with the military maybe thinking that, you know, Native Americans might, you know, have better hearing or be able to see better or something like that. And part of that you blamed on the movies because obviously yes. the movies really, like, push us to think that it's reality, you know. I think you mentioned that you loved Clint Eastwood. Oh, yes, yes. I think Clint Eastwood is a, a very good actor, and he, he's pretty proud to share his talents with the Indian people, and he gave them a fair shot, you know. He, he didn't have them speaking broken English and, you know, just acting stupid. Yeah. He gave he them a chance respect. to be themselves, and yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, very much. I, I feel like Clint Eastwood is someone that would be so cool to meet. So you were in the Army, and you had some challenges when you were in the service with drinking at the time, and, and then it sounds like you sobered up, right? And then you got a great job at Allison Motors. Yes, I, I drank a couple of years, I guess, after I got out of the service, and then uh, I got a wonderful job, Allison Division of General Motors. Nice. And I worked there for a year. I was drinking, but I was holding it down as much as I could. And then I went on a pretty good toot, and uh, I started missing some work, and they sent me a letter. And what it meant was shape up or get the hell out of here. And I, right. So that was enough to jar me a little bit, and I said, I'll never get a job like this again. So I quit drinking right there. Wow. And it took a little while to straighten up. I felt like everybody was looking at me, and I felt weird, but... Uh, I overcame it, and then I made a pretty good name for myself at Allison. I, did, right. I retired from there, and I, w I was pretty happy with my job. I was pretty proud of it. That's great. I mean, I, I love that they, you know, said, hey, you know, we're worried about you. You need to shape up or ship out, and then you were yeah, there well, they a laid long it on time, the line. right? And I was fortunate that uh, our union started college classes, so I got a couple of degrees while I was... Uh, That's awesome. Uh, what did you study? That, I studied management and uh, marketing, so I got degrees in that, and uh, I was happy about that. I got good pay for it, too, as well wow. under the GI Bill. That really, you know, makes me proud of the GI Bill. I'm proud of GM for um, seeing that they had a good employee on their hands. They just needed to give a second chance. And, and the reason I bring up the fact that you did overcome that, and, and for some people we would say they're in recovery or, or however you want to say it, but... I know that there are people out there listening that may be struggling in the same way, and I think that your story is very inspirational. Well, I think that if a person makes up their mind, they can quit. Yeah. The same thing with smoking. I tried to, everything you could think of to quit, but then I decided that it's time to quit. I made up my mind, and, and I quit smoking. <laughs> and I know that has to be a very hard habit to quit. It took me a couple of days. to. I was nervous, and I'd yeah. reach for a cigarette when I'd get through eating and yeah. But but I made it, and uh, I don't crave any drinking or smoking now. I'm pretty clean on that. <laughs> That's great. That's great. And on top of it, again, you worked for a great company who they seem to appreciate you, and I've always known you, you to drive really fancy trucks because you're still on that 
program, right? Like you get a good deal on trucks from there on out or something. <laughs> Don't hate me. I, I drive an F-150, but I, I also do like the Chevy products. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> so let's talk more about your tribe, the Chippewa, and their history. I know that in the late 17s and early 1800s, the Chippewa, as you kind of mentioned before, they came from Canada to North Dakota, correct? Well, we started out in Canada. A lot of the people came from the West Coast, I believe, and uh, moving west, following the game and stuff. In the mm. summertime, they'd move up into Canada, following the game, and they married with the, the Indian women there. And like I said, they, that was Cree country, so we were probably part Cree. Yeah. And so that that's how we got started. We were, the French people married the Indian women, and well, they used the, the bad term of squaw, which that is a very bad word. Yeah, why don't you share a little about that with our listeners? Remember the real name, the squaw is just short for a, it's squatejo or something like this. And uh, what it means is a woman's vagina. So that's what they're calling the women oh. when they, they shortened it to squaw. And so was that a term that the white folks picked up on and that's how they started saying the women? Or, or were the natives also saying squaw when they would talk about women? Well, some of them did, some of them didn't. Uh, yeah. Those that followed the Indian culture, of course, and, and knew the, the languages, they they wanted to call their women women folk, and, but uh, a lot of them didn't care. They went along with the term squaw because it came so prominent in the movies. Mm-hmm. Indian squaw, she's just a squaw. Or... Once again, the movies <laughs> set the precedence <laughs> for a lot of things, and and again, right. it could be that the writers knew what the word was maybe they didn't but it caught on and then people started realizing hey that's not a very good name to call a woman it's dying down now you don't hear that word very much anymore and i'm happy about that i agree but, uh, it took uh, some fighting to get a get over it well thank people. you for respecting our native women yeah. We had to correct people when they would ask them you know not to refer to our ladies as squaws yeah you can say women or ladies, or girls, the squaw. We tell them what it meant, and and they felt kind of ashamed after they right learned yeah. what it meant. You know, sometimes so, we all just need to learn and and change our. But it, it's our going away now. I I appreciate that. For our listeners, the Chippewa are now known as the Ojibwe or Anishinaabe people, and they came from Ontario, Canada, North Dakota, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota areas. They traded furs with the French, who were often married into the tribe. In fact, they fought with the French in the Indian War against the British. On the other hand, they allied with the British during the American Revolution. As you mentioned, they lost a lot of their lands, 11 million acres, just in North Dakota and Wisconsin, so they regained a portion of that by accepting the reservation lands. There's a certain priest that you had talked about the other day who did a lot of work for the Chippewa. So I did a little research on him. It sounds like the natives he worked with admired him. But then again, we know sometimes history is skewed towards a certain direction. But at face value, here's what I discovered. Georges-Antoine Belcourt was born in 1803 and was a French-Canadian Roman Catholic priest ordained in 1827. Belcourt did a lot in his few years on Earth, so I'm going to give a quick rundown on his activities as quickly as possible so we can get back to your family story. He studied the Algonquin and Anishinaabe language, which were not yet in written form. So within a year of studies, he was deemed ready to work with the Indians, who he called savages at the time. At the opposition of the local bishop, who said the natives wouldn't stay in one spot for very long, Belcourt established a mission and school in 1834 in Bay St. Paul, and small surrounding homes for the natives. A woman who spoke Chippewa was the teacher, and five natives were admitted to Holy Communion. However, to Belcourt's dismay, after the Chippewa were baptized, they quickly returned to their spiritual practices of old. Belcourt also considered establishing a mission in Rainy Lake, but when he found out that the natives were unwilling to give up drinking... They would purchase liquor from Hudson's Bay Company. By the way, remember that name. He dismissed the idea because he required sobriety in order to convert to Christianity. He highly discouraged the consumption of alcohol amongst the natives and even petitioned to make liquor trafficking from Canada to the United States illegal. 
He also set up a study group in which members were required to be teetotalers, those who would abstain from drinking alcohol. Belcour also arranged for a Chippewa language dictionary to be published in 1838. Also, a dysentery epidemic had come through the Manitoba communities in 1846. So Belcour joined some hunters heading south that summer, and they'd carried disease along with them, which killed 25 people within less than a month's time. Some days, as many as eight people died at a time. So Belcour traveled with some of the hunters to Fort Berthold Indian Reservation to seek medicine for the sick. He brought the medicine to the ill, and then he went on his way hunting. The next year, Belcourt sought help from Queen Victoria to address discrimination by Hudson's Bay Company's fur trade with the Indians, stating there was a monopoly in the fur trading industry. 977 First Nations people signed a petition, but there was little sympathy for the natives and the case went nowhere. In fact, Belcourt was criticized for causing unrest among the natives, so he was arrested but was later released. Belcourt also set up a petition that had 100 Matisse families' names to protest the Hudson Bay Company's encroachment of the natives' trade of pemmican and buffalo robes. By the way, pemmican is buffalo meat that has been dried and pounded and mixed with buffalo fat. And in 1845, when natives were crossing the borders into Canada, Belcourt fought for buffalo hunters to be able to cross during the hunts. Bishop Provencher was Belcourt's leadership, and he always had the stink eye on Belcourt and worried that he had so-called gone native by helping the natives out so much. Belcourt went on many buffalo hunts, and he also documented about the hunts, the roots and the methods and more. With all of this advocacy and the drama that Belcourt caused with the Hudson Bay Company, Bishop Promolchet kept reining him in and would recall him to Quebec or place him in you know, new towns and put him into new missions, but Belcourt just kept pushing the envelope. In 1848, Belcourt attempted to convert the Chippewa and the Matisse to Catholicism by establishing missions in Pembina, North Dakota, and held communion with 92 Native Americans. By the way, the Matisse term was given to those Cree and Ojibwe who were married to fur traders that were Scottish and French. Belcourt also opened a mission located at Turtle Mountain. Later, of course, in 1882, Turtle Mountain Reservation was established. In 1853, he established a church and a school in North Dakota and what is now called Wahala. He wanted to create a large metropolis and even laid out a European grid for the city, which consisted of open square areas and wide streets. He planned for water, fertile soil opportunities, and more, but it never caught on, and today the town only has 885 residents. In 1859, Belcourt launched the Farmer's Bank of Rustico on Prince Edward Island, which was Canada's first community-based bank. He also set up a parish library in which Emperor Napoleon III assisted by sending 1,000 French francs per year. The man stayed super busy. He also built a vehicle that was steam-powered in 1866, the first one driven in Canada. I've read that natives traveled from far and wide to meet Belcourt, whom they named the Great Spirit. He died in 1874, and a town in North Dakota was named after him. Now, having said all that, Leroy, is this similar to what you had heard about Belcourt? Were your memories of this story among the natives, you know, as favorable or no? It's pretty, pretty accurate, all right enough. It was pretty spotty the way we heard it. I don't think uh, anybody ever tried to put it together that much. Uh, we just accepted it. And, yeah. And, uh, so that, that's the way it was. But uh, the, the people do recall... Some of the elders recalled Father Belcourt, and they talked about Father Belcourt to wow. my parents, and my parents talked to me about it. And so we had respect for Father Belcourt. He might have wanted to stop him from drinking, but uh, he didn't do it. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. We, st we were still drinking, and that that was, like I said, a very sad thing. We couldn't. You could buy liquor in Canada, but you couldn't buy it once you got across the line. Right. Well, that kind of reminds me of a story. Let's uh, hear it. I was very, very young. I didn't even know there was a Canada, but uh, I heard later. My dad, he hooked up the, the horses to the sled. We, had a, we called the bob sled, and mm -hmm. team of horses, and we went north. I knew which way north was, but I was very young. Yeah. And we went into Canada, and my dad would buy a case of beer, 
and then we'd be coming coming back. We were a little ways into Canada, that probably about 15, 20 miles up there, and, and coming back, there were these Mounties or red coats, but uh, they weren't wearing red coats. They were they were on horseback, but they didn't look like the fancy red coats you've seen in the movies. They 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 looked really sharp. But right. These guys were riding in the cold, and they they weren't trying to look sharp in red coats. <laughs> but we we knew where they, who they were, and my dad would tell me to take the reins. He'd be sitting in the back drinking beer. Well, I thought I was really handling these horses, but they knew where to go better than <laughs> I did. And the closer we got to the reservation line, the faster we were we were picking up speed. You know, they, yeah. they wanted to get home. Right. And the Mountie would be riding behind us, and he'd be coming at a pretty good gallop. And my dad would take a beer, and he'd throw it out the back. <laughs> they'd get off and drink the beer. <laughs> and we'd go scooting across the line, and... Wow. We'd come home with uh, whatever beer he had left. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, I made one trip like that, and uh, I, I remember parts of it. Uh, I don't remember all of it, but yeah. uh, wow. I was very young at the time. <laughs> what a story! I know they're like, well, just keep giving us the beer; we'll leave you alone. <laughs> I love well, it. Well, that, that wasn't the end of it. When he got home, he had to answer to my mother. So, ah, <laughs> uh. he'd probably been better off answering to the Mounties. <laughs> She's like, you let little Leroy handle the horses? What? <laughs> That's a great story. Keep those coming. I love it. A little more about the Chippewa. There are about 170,000 living in the United States today and about 160,000 in Canada. So your family has this long history on the Turtle Mountain Reservation. And on your mother's side, I think you mentioned one time that they were the first people on the reservation, right? What was their last name? St. Arnold. My grandfather's name was John Baptist St. Arnold. They had some cattle. My grandfather had a a store in, in what they call St. Joseph, Canada. Okay. St. Joseph is gone now, but uh, one time, a setting bull came in. They were starving. His, his men and him and his men were starving. As the story goes, he grabbed a little boy, put a knife to his throat, and told his uh, his men to take what the, what they needed. You know. Yeah. And there was an old older man. He was a a matriff, a Mati. He went up to Sitting Bull, and he told him. He said, "Put that knife away." He said, "We'll give you some food to get you by, but you leave that little boy alone." Yeah. And that story has been around because I don't. I wish I remembered a man's name. Wow! But he must have been a very, very brave. Uh, yeah. Man to walk up to Sitting Bull with a knife, you know. Stand up to Sitting Bull. Wow! <laughs> but that was in my grandfather's store. They had some cattle, and Father Belcourt wanted those cattle on the reservation. Mm. And that was pretty much the same with the Maladair family. They had had cattle too, and but I don't know if my my grandfather was born. In the United States or in Canada. My mother was born in Canada. My grandmother, she was married in 1873. That was up in Canada. Well, she was just a, a very little girl, and she saw people dancing on the streets in, in this town, wherever she was, and they were yelling, Lincoln, not Ramal, Lincoln is dead. And they were very happy about it. I really never did figure out uh, why they would have been so happy about it, but uh, that's the way the story goes. So I got to thinking about that story since you mentioned it to me not too long ago. So after doing some research, I could only come up with two theories, and neither one is foolproof, but here they are. First off, there was an article written in 2015 by Michelle McGeeg in the Canadian press that stood out to me. The article is titled, Lincoln Assassination Plot Had Canadian Link in Origin and Ending. I'll read just some excerpts from the article. Some historians suspect the groundwork for a plot to kill the U.S. Civil War president was partially laid in a Canadian city that had become a haven for his political foes. They say it was a Canadian who ultimately led the effort that brought down Lincoln's assassin. Historian John Boyko researched Canada's direct contribution to the 19th century conflict in his book, Blood and Daring, How Canada Fought the American Civil War and Forged a Nation. 
He said John Wilkes Booth, the American stage actor whose fame shifted to infamy after killing the president, had long been conspiring to bring down the anti-slavery Union government. Boyko said his plans almost certainly came under discussion when Booth made a nine-day visit to Montreal in October 1864. What Booth was trying to do was put together a team of people that could arrange the kidnapping, later the assassination, of Lincoln. Boyko said in a telephone interview from Lakefield, Ontario, History shows that American Southerners opposed to Lincoln's policies were able to find safe haven within their northern neighbor, which was officially not involved in the Civil War. University of Toronto professor Robert Bothwell said both Toronto and Montreal emerged as particular hubs of anti-Union activity, adding that Confederate President Jefferson Davis eventually made Montreal his home in the years after his cause was defeated. Bothwell said Confederate sympathizers likely found pockets of strong support for their views in Canada, where British-born colonists who shared their pro-slavery sentiments had also developed some anti-American feelings of their own. They really wanted to see the end of the Union and of the United States, Bothwell said of the Canadian sympathizers. Some of it is just strategic. If the United States were weakened, British North America plus the Confederacy would make for a very different kind of continent. Boyko said Booth and several like-minded people gathered at Montreal's St. Lawrence Hall, a hotel whose pro-Southern leanings prompted it to advertise the best mint juleps in the city. Historical accounts suggest Booth spoke openly of his disdain for Lincoln during that trip. That death, Boyko said, was largely orchestrated by a Quebec-born soldier who was among tens of thousands of Canadians to enlist in the Union Army. So it could be this was why the story you were told about your family cheering on Lincoln's assassination and their being so close to Canada, uh, some Canadians seem to have been pleased to hear of Lincoln's death. Maybe that's it. The other theory I came up with was there were over 300 Sioux who were part of an uprising in which it's reported they had fought with white settlers over the fact that they were starving due to lack of food access. This was called the Sioux Uprising of 1862. Lincoln read every one of the capital cases about these Sioux fighters and ultimately commuted 265 of them without sentencing and 38 who were guilty of rape or murder during the event to be hanged on December 26, 1862. By the way, this was the U.S.'s largest mass hanging at the time. Three years later, Lincoln was assassinated. Could it be that possibly the Chippewa saw Lincoln as an executioner of their fellow natives? I should point out, however, that the Chippewa and the Sioux were enemies, but nonetheless, they were both natives, so perhaps they could come together on this one point. Who knows? Those are my theories, but I'm open to ideas if any listeners out there know otherwise why the Chippewa would cheer over Lincoln's assassination. All right, well, those, so... those were very interesting stories. I love yeah? them. <laughs> and they do make sense, but... Uh... Yeah, it just made me so curious. I was like, why would they cheer? You know. Well, I knew about the hanging part, different parts of it. I didn't know the whole story, but I picked up different yeah. bits and pieces. It's very good. I go along with that. All right. We get a two thumbs up from Lori. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was very curious when I heard that, too. It just, um, it's interesting. So tell me more about, actually, your family. Tell me about your dad. My dad was born, well, it was, it was not on the reservation, but he was born in a neighboring town close to the reservation. My grandfather named him Riel because my grandfather kind of admired Louis Riel. So my dad, dad's name became Riel Malater. Louis Riel, uh, some people liked him, some people didn't, but uh, he had quite a history up there in Canada. Mm -hmm. He wanted to fight. Well, what he wanted to do was make the Métis or the Machif a country. He didn't want to be part of Canada or part of the States. He wanted to establish his own country. He put up a pretty good fight. Yeah. A lot of the Chippewa people, are like on our reservation in surrounding areas, they did not want to help him. He had to go to, I think he went to Montana. Maybe he went to Minnesota. But he recruited enough of them to put up a real good fight. But, but he wow. lost. <laughs> he lost. He tried. And for our listeners, that name is Riel, R-I-E-L, if you want to look him up. He founded Manitoba. And for the Matisse people, he was a political leader, and he also came against the trading monopoly that was the Hudson Bay Company. Today, Hudson's Bay Company is still in existence. So back to your family. Your dad was Riel Alexander Malater, 1898 to 1972. 
And again, he was named after that famous Louis Riel. Yes. Correct? Okay. So interestingly enough, your father was born and buried in Belcourt, North Dakota, as our guests will recall, the priest Georges Belcourt that we talked about earlier. I noticed on Ancestry.com that your dad worked for the Great Northern Railroad and also that he had lost the large toe on his left foot. Do you know anything about how he lost that toe? No, because I had already left, you know, for into the military, and I just went back for visits from then on. Yeah. So I was not aware of that then. Wow. There's a photo of, of a piece of paper where it kind of gives a description. Is there anything descriptive about this person? And that's where they talk about the uh, the missing the toe. I thought that was interesting. Well, I know he got drugged by a horse for a, for a long time. Oh, really? Way. Oh, no. So I don't know the whole story on that, but I know that that did happen. And wow. I think he lost his toe after after I left. Gotcha. I'm so not real familiar with that. Well, and being that he worked for a railroad, I guess we could surmise it may have had something to do with that, but who That's knows? That's quite possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so your mother, uh, what was her first name? Margaret. My dad always called her Magritte, kind of a French accent. She hated that, but uh, <laughs> her name was Margaret Mary St. Okay. Arnold. Oh, that's a beautiful name. And what was she like? Well, she was very, very into the Catholic religion. And she was very anti-Indian, very anti dimity language. Hmm. And she thought that that was just a low language. That I guess that they fig- she figured the people that talked it couldn't talk anything else. But wow. that's not really true. It, it was a beautiful language. But her mother and, and her and a lot of other people just thought that that was a terrible language because it was made up of so many different uh, And she hated the language just like the rest of them. She was very strong Catholic, very yeah. strong. With a name like Mary Margaret, you'd almost have to, right? Of course, back then, if, you know, if you belonged to a different religion, you were, you were going to hell. There was no question about it. If you weren't Catholic, that was it, and that was my mother. She preached Catholic and prayers, and she was very religious. So she lived, this Mary Margaret, lived from 1896 to 1986. And can you even imagine what someone who was born in the 1890s must have seen and lived through up through the 1980s? I bet she definitely had a story. And so she and your father had seven children together. Is that correct? Nine. Nine. Okay. Yeah. My mother had uh, had 12 children. She was married before okay. my dad. So she had three children and, and then... The rest were with my dad. It's a big family. What was it like growing up in such a big family? <laughs> well, I was the, not the youngest one, but pretty close to the youngest one. And uh, like in World War II, three of my brothers went into the service. And then my sister wasn't too far behind. She graduated. She had went to Haskell. And so I was probably into my early teens when most of the family had gone on their different ways. Mm-hmm. So I stayed on at the, at the home place till. Till I went into the service. I went in at 18. So you must right. have been the favorite for sticking around, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was quite a job. My dad was a railroad man, and he was gone all the time. and He had a pretty bad gambling habit, uh, so that didn't help. We were pretty, very, very poor on the, on the reservation. My high school year took care of my grandparents, and my dad never gave me any money, so I earned $20 a month taking care of my grandparents. And I had to make do with that. I wasn't the best dressed kid in school, (laughs) but I did okay. I I got through it and went into the service. Then I sobered up after I got out and my my life fell in place. Again, inspirational story. You know, you mentioned your grandparents and uh, we were trying to recall your grandparents' name on your dad's side. And I did look in Ancestry.com and it looks like their names may have been Jeremiah and Alphonsine. Does that sound right? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Cool. And yeah, then on yeah. your mom's side, perhaps Jean Baptiste, which I think you mentioned earlier, and then Julia Saint Arnold. Is that correct? Okay. Just wanted to make sure because I think it's really important as we talk about your history and your family that we want to honor and respect, you know, those who came before us. And so I definitely wanted to give your grandparents at least their names on here. So you mentioned that your dad uh, had a gambling addiction. I know that you mentioned that he may have drank some too, and then uh, there was money in your family, but he had kind of, with that gambling addiction, he had lost some of it. And so does that mean that, you know, the way you grew up was a little challenging? I mean, did you ever look at other kids and go, oh, I, I wish oh, I had yes, what they had? Oh, yes, yes. I uh, 
I just wish my dad had a Model A, and he kept that all the way up into the 50s. And wow. I was so ashamed that I had to ride in that old Model A. It was falling apart, and other people had nice uh, automobiles, you know. And that was hard to swallow. I finally got an old automobile myself, but my dad took that and started driving it. Oh, <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Uh, but we were very poor in regards to others on the reservation. But it was... Uh, like I said, it was my dad's own fault because he, he gambled a lot of that money away. Yeah. And that was kind of sad. And I did get teased quite a bit about that whole Model A. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Darn it, Dad. Can you please not pick me up in the Model A? Let me walk <laughs> home. <laughs> and then you had, your family had horses and cattle too, right? Yes. Well, it was my grandfather that had a lot of land. And uh, he got that when, when the reservation first started, I guess. He had horses and cattle. As a matter of fact, he had a lot of thoroughbred horses, and he used to ride them in races himself. He was wow. a man with a long beard. Up until his 70s, he was still riding race horses. Love it. <laughs> yeah. When he passed away, they divided up the, well, he had divided up the land among the boys, and my dad got his share, and he got the horses. But my dad didn't care anything about racing horses. He put these race horses on the plow. <laughs> The horses are like, we're meant to run, not pull things. <laughs> when I was growing up, the horses we had, you could still trace back to my grandfather's horses. They were not race horses, that's for sure. <laughs> not right. now. <laughs> well, it sounds like life may not have always been easy from when you were little. But like you said, like many of us, we didn't always know we were poor. And I also was thinking about how, you know, you and I talked about recently the topic of racism, and you stated that you thankfully haven't experienced a, a lot of it, but on occasion you've seen it here and there. I, I remember you talking about you went into a bar one time in the 1950s, and you said that they would say, we don't serve Indians. And then one time you talked about how you had a cultural event at a booth, and they'd say in a broken tone, you speak English, and I'd say, yes, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel like you have to tell those. Well, I was, uh, this was at the uh, International Festival at Booth, and all of just about every country you could think of, a lot of uh, Asian countries, and Germany, and Switzerland, and Europe, South America, Canada. We had everybody there. We were representing the United States. And a lot of times they would come up and say, you speak English, well, sometimes I say yes, and like you said, then sometimes I get a little tired of it, and I make a snappy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you're, you're right about that. <laughs> well, what I couldn't understand, and, and our, our men in overseas did the same thing to the native people. They kind of speak broken English to them. And, you know, I couldn't understand why why speaking broken English would help the person <laughs> right. to understand. You know, it, it just didn't... Uh, so they're like, oh, let's see if he understands us. Let me speak broken English. That's even less understandable to see well, if I we think, speak uh, the same. Jay Silverheels brought a lot of that on. When, you know, Jay Silverheels and uh, the Lone Ranger, they were very oh. uh, prominent at one time. And of course, Jay Silverheels, he was kind of an Indian hero. The only one they ever had in the movies, I guess, him speaking his broken English that I guess everybody thought that's the way we spoke. <laughs> Thank you again, movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am so grateful that, you know, for decades, you've still practiced your culture and, and you're able to share that with others, including myself and my daughter. Um, a few years back when she and I were, she would work on the Native American Youth Advisory Board and you were able to show her and others on the board your culture and traditions and just took time to help them understand more about the Chippewa. And, you know, she was just in awe of that. And you're very active also in powwows now. So tell us a little bit more about that. I didn't know much about powwows when I first came to Indiana. I got with uh, some of the Indian people here, but who was really responsible for my, my advancement in the Indian culture was my wife. She came into our council, and she decided that we should have a powwow. So she put on a powwow, and turned out it was one of the biggest powwows here in Indiana for, for a long time. Wow. She insisted that I MC. Well, see, I was pretty new in, in this thing, and I didn't know a lot. So uh, I started emceeing, but uh, what mistakes I made, there were a lot of other Indian people that corrected me, and I remembered what they said, so I learned a, a lot mm -hmm. being the MC, I learned a lot, and I learned it fast. I bet. <laughs> Didn't want to make those but mistakes. It, it was uh, 
I'll give her uh, credit for uh, really pushing me into it, you know. That's great. Because uh, I would have just rode along and let what happened happen. And, but right. she pushed me, and I, I made a lot of things happen that way. So. Absolutely. And, and for those who haven't been to a powwow, the MC or Master of Ceremonies announces to the public about the schedule of events as they occur, leading out the dancers and singers and maintaining the drum rotation and start. So when you're at the powwows, do you do the traditional Chippewa dances? Well, some of them are, but we call them intertribals now, and, and we can dance in our, our Chippewa way, but the, the dancing has pretty much come together now. Some of the people have different styles, but uh, still we have the traditional, men's traditional, and of course the younger people, they want to show off a little bit. That's that's what it is, actually. Yeah. And they like competition, so they, they really move fast and... Uh, of course, some time back, I don't remember how long ago it was, the, the girls said that they could, if the boys can do that competition, that they should be able to do it too. And, and they won out and they have some nice lady fancy dances and they can move pretty rapidly oh, too. I bet. They have to be careful. To, they don't let the dresses come over the knees. But they, they can still get around pretty good. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting watching. But we have a lot of different dances. Uh, they're pretty much intertribal. The grass dance started way up in Dakota Territory, maybe. Uh, all they did was uh, had a bunch of kids running around knocking the, the grass down. And there was a young man. He thought that should be a dance. So he started putting grass in his belt, and he insisted that they start dancing. And he, he was the one, I don't remember his name now, but he was the one that started the grass dance. Huh. And that was way up north, the grass dance, but it's, it's gone all over the United States yeah. now. Our it's listeners, we should all look that up. Look up the grass dance. I had a, a visitor from Germany. My friend brought him over to, to visit with me, and uh, they have grass dances in, in Germany. Oh, really? Okay. Yes, they have huh. Indian societies, I think they call them. And yeah. They practice the Indian culture. And I think that's quite a, a compliment to us. Absolutely. I love that, that that they're doing that over there. That's great. And I side note, you talked about ballroom dancing before, and you started ballroom dancing at a young age, right? Uh, very young. We had what we called bush dances. These were held in people's homes. We did waltzes and polkas, but a lot of times the families would all go to the dances, but the men didn't dance. Or sometimes a, a lady who might have been a widow or something like this, but they'd ask the younger men to dance. And in those days, you didn't say no to an elder. That's right. They told you to sit down, you sat down. You sit down. They told you to get up and dance, you got up and danced. That's right. Yes, sir. So we learned, and from then on, uh, I started picking up more and more ballroom steps, and uh, I I got to enjoying ballroom dancing very well. I quit a few years back. I didn't quit. I just took a break. Forced to slow down (laughs) because of illness, and I'm on. I wanted to pick it up again if I can. That's great. We'll be looking for you down at the Indiana Ballroom, or what's the name of the place where everyone goes in Indiana? Well, there are different places where we do ballroom dancing. Sometimes they have them at the Eagles Clubs or the Moose Clubs, and they have different places. I don't remember them right offhand, but I'm going to start going now. I'm glad. I want you to keep it up. It it kept me going physically and mentally, and and I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to pick it up again. I mean, not only does ballroom dancing make everybody happy, but it's also such great exercise, right? Yeah, well, it's a little different from those on the, they have the dance contests on on TV. Yeah. And these two dancers, they practice with each other, you know, and they get all these fancy steps. Right. Well, see, real ballroom dancing, you can ask anybody on the, on the floor out there to dance, and you pretty much have, get along dancing. It's not choreography, ballroom dancing. It's stuff that you learn when you start picking it up and go along with the flow. (laughs) Well, I'm always in awe of people who I know there's a lot of practice and work and learning how to be a ballroom dancer, but a friend of mine took me to uh, go ballroom dancing. It's the only time I've ever been. And it was so wonderful because the the men were such gentlemen and they would ask us to dance and that kind of thing. But I was wearing stupidly, I was wearing shoes with no back on them on the the strap on the back of the heel and I flung one of my shoes across the ballroom under a table so I had to dance the rest of that one with no shoe on and then go humble myself and go pull my shoe out from under the table that was not my best moment 
but... That must have been difficult. It really was. I sat down after that. I think you would enjoy it. It, it takes a while to get into it, you know. Yeah. I know after I sobered up and around, my, my wife told me, she said, you're one of the better dancers out here. Why are you so tense? And I don't know. I felt like everybody was looking at me. And yeah. It wasn't so, but I started loosening up and then everybody come up and say, you know, you're a good dancer. And I got back into my ballroom dancing. The romantical Indian. <laughs> there you go. That's right. <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing with me about one of your many things that you like to do. Uh, you're good with woodworking and also with ballroom dancing, and and we really appreciated the good work that you do at the powwows. So what would you like for people to know about the powwows? The main thing is that, in a way, a, a lot of it is a form of prayer. We pray by dancing. We pray by saying prayers, and we, we offer things to the creator and tobacco and we burn different herbs. We honor north, south, east, and west. That's where we get all of the things that we need to live by. And that's all pretty important. So the dances, although they, they may not look like a prayer or anything to a, to a stranger, the dances are very, very meaningful, especially the traditional dances that the men and women, the older men and women do. These are very important. They're sort of like a prayer. You keep good things in mind, you know, you think that you're dancing for the creator and in turn you're asking the creator to help them you know to take care of the mother earth and well if we didn't have mother earth we wouldn't have much true <laughs> so we try to emphasize to not only to our own children but we emphasize these things to the visitors mm -hmm. we let them know why we're dancing and what it means to all of us and speaking of visitors, is anyone allowed to these powwows? I mean, I know that there are some that are closed and some that are more open. The ones that you do here in Indiana, uh, are they usually open? Yes, they're pretty much very open. And I, I do invite the public to come in and dance with us. And I That's tell great. them, don't worry, you know, if you're a good dancer or not. If you don't feel like it, somebody will come in and they'll show you how to do it, you know. Yeah. Everyone is welcome in the arena. The only thing is, in the arena, that's the sacred area. And we don't allow any trouble. We don't allow weapons. We don't allow drinking or smoking. Mm -hmm. That's the sacred area. And you got to have your right frame of mind when you come into it. We do invite the public. But we let them know that that is the sacred area. And we'd like for them to, to dance with us. But keep in mind why we're doing it. And along those lines, since it is a sacred area, isn't it kind of the rule to not be taking photos as well in that area? Sometimes there is a certain dance. We call them honor dances. Or sometimes there's prayers going on. And we ask when we're praying orally or when we're doing an honor dance, we ask that pictures not be taken. But DMC will tell them when they can mm. take pictures and not. But for the most part, you, you can take pictures. And so for people who, you mentioned that it is open, uh, you know, a lot of the powwows here, if there are people out there who are, you know, have, have zero Native American blood in their veins, what would you tell to someone like that who maybe doesn't want to come to one of these things because they feel like they'll be judged for not also being Native American? What do you think about that and what would you say to them? Well, first off, everyone is welcome into the arena. It doesn't make any difference uh, what race or anything like that, that doesn't mean anything to us. We just ask them to respect our culture and, and they're welcome to share with us. A lot of them just come in and they are, for the most part, very, very respectful. So I, I enjoy and I encourage people to come and I encourage them to dance with us and learn about our culture because uh, our culture is not that far out. I think the main thing is Besides worshiping the Creator, is taking care of the land and the ground and the Mother Earth. So, you know, that should kind of pertain to everybody around the world. Well said. We've got to take care of our Mother Earth, and we're losing a lot of it, you know. Like right now, there's uh, tremendous fires going on in the, in the West, and there's floods. And, you know, we've got to pray and ask the Creator to help us to cope with these things and maybe prevent them in the future. We've got to leave this Mother Earth in, in good shape for our children. We can't use up all the resources and, and just let our children go without. We've got to teach them and preserve not only our culture, but uh, Mother Earth and, 
anything good coming from the earth, we got to try to preserve it. I think preserve is a very good word. Uh, you know, preserving the earth, preserving also you're being here today. You're you're helping to preserve your stories, your your family's stories, and about you know Belcourt and all these different <laughs> things. But you know, the language itself, you know, um, the Chippewa language, and talking about that. How do you feel like the language itself has survived? I think it's going to survive because they are, for a long time, they wouldn't teach it. They're, they didn't want us to be, be Indian. They didn't want us to speak any Indian language. It's okay to speak French, but we couldn't speak any English language. Now they're teaching it on the reservation. Wow, isn't that great? Yes, Good. that is wonderful. And the kids are taking this in stride. They like that. They, You know, they used to be that you had to kind of hang your head because you were Indian and stay in the back. But that's changing now. We can hold up our head and we're true Americans and we'll share our culture and we'll respect yours. Absolutely. So keeping that language alive for all of our tribes is incredibly crucial. I take uh, my own tribal language classes um, during the spring and fall on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. Um, you can go to the Choctaw Nation website to find out how to learn more Choctaw. But in this case, if our listeners would like to learn the Ojibwe language, you know, that's Chippewa became titled as Ojibwe, please check out my native Choc Talk Facebook page where I'll list the link for lessons, which is ojibwe.net slash lessons slash overview. And Ojibwe is spelled O-J-I-B-W-E. So you have a quite a few talents, Leroy. For instance, you once made a lovely cedar box for me, and you've done so for many others. Tell us more about that and other items you create. And by the way, I got to take some pictures of your beautiful cedar boxes, so I'll be sure to post those on my Native Chalk Talk Facebook page as well. So tell us more about some of the items you create. Well, I've, I always wanted to be a carpenter, but I never did make it. I, and then when I, when I got out of the service and when I sobered up, I started buying tools. I started making outdoor furniture. And oh. Then I started making indoor furniture. And then I started making toys. And then when I when I got very involved in the Indian culture, I just couldn't make enough cedar boxes. I've been making cedar boxes for 30 years. And, and you see what my inventory is. I've got about 14 boxes. <laughs> yeah, they're beautiful too. <laughs> and uh, well, by the way, I want you to have one. You can take it. Oh, my one. gosh. I was eyeing them earlier. Thank you so much. I would love to have one. Thank you. Well, you're welcome to. They're pretty much all the same, these that I have. I love it. You can well, take and one. <laughs> you say they're the same, but if you look at the patterns on the top, they have these beautiful swirls in them from just the, the oh, natural yes, they're all way. Oh, yeah, made out of cedar. And, uh, yeah. It's a beautiful wood, but it's the aroma. That, uh, oh, right. See, that preserves, uh, you put feathers in there and it preserves uh, mildew and keeps uh, insects out. And So my sisters and I are all very honored to receive eagle feathers from the repository. They're very important to us. The eagle, you know, is uh, you fly so high that you can carry our voice, our prayers, carry them toward the creator. Beautiful. And that's one of the things that we respect about the eagle. Beautiful. And we... When we get a feather, we're, we're honored. And, you know, you just don't take a feather and say, I'm Indian. And right, you, right. You've got to earn these feathers. And, Absolutely. And when you get them, you, it helps you, and, and you're protecting the feather and the culture, too. So mm -hmm. it, it's a very good thing. But when you have a feather, you want to protect it. Absolutely. Take care of it. You don't worship it. You respect it. Yeah. That's a lot of people think we worship the moon or the sun. We don't worship the Mother Earth. We have the highest respect for her. We want to take care of her. We don't worship the respect that they're there. We know what. Mm -hmm. We couldn't live without the without these things. But it's very interesting for all of us to hear. We don't worship those things, but we do respect them. Yeah, and they mean something to us. So, as far as the cedar boxes go, they're beautiful. I, like I said, I had a chance to see your woodworking shop and the good things you're doing in there. And then I think you used to. You mentioned making toys for children. Do you still do that? Oh, not very much. I do still make... A, one thing that went really big was my toy tops. Yeah. I sold a lot of them at work. Half of the money I'd donate. I'd have whoever bought the top from me give me half the money and donate the rest to... Well, it might have been Toys for Tots. Different, like, things different going Different organizations. On the, yeah, organizations and all I'd that. I'd have the people themselves... I'd have the people themselves make the donation. So That's great. That made me feel pretty good that 
Yeah. I knew we were making donations. Yes. I felt pretty good about being a part of it. And I, I bet those tops look so pretty. I don't have one here, but uh, I take a lot of pride in when I make them because I, I want to make them perfect, and they spin a long time. <laughs> right. Very fast. <laughs> I bet. I think you had said at one point that they were made of antlers or buffalo or cow or oh, something. The, the old toy tops that we had years ago, they were made of the horns of cattle, and they used a whip, and we'd play on the ice and try to knock the others top out of the ice uh, out of the ring uh, so cool that's kind of died out now i haven't seen anything like that and, since i was a kid we need to bring it back <laughs> well i i'm thinking about it <laughs> totally i would it support might be that fun. effort i don't know if anybody would be interested now but that was just some some of the elders even at that time the grown-ups they put a little money on it too <laughs> well i mean if if you know, folks are listening right now. So if anyone, you know, hears this and is like, hey, Leroy, bring the tops back, then maybe we'd have something there. Maybe start more well, charity stuff. I do take stuff some of these uh, wooden tops. I make them on the, on the lathes. Now it used to be I had to whittle them out by hand. Oh, wow. But now I put them right on the wood lathe and they come out perfect. Wow. Good thing for all those good technology and tools <laughs> that have come out. <laughs> So obviously you're very talented in multiple ways, and I've always known you to also have the talent of telling fabulous stories. So why don't you tell us the one about the Chippewa and the bridge? Okay. Well, this started quite by accident because there was a, a fellow on the reservation. He was a mischief, like us, half Indian and half French. But for some reason, he developed a Norwegian accent and that was okay. Nobody said much about it, but everybody changed his name. It, it was Julius Patra. We pr pronounced it Patra. Patra is the way it pronounced it. But they changed his name to Norwegian. Not the Norwegian, just Norwegian, Norwegian. And one year, he moved out to uh, between Mandan and Bismarck. That's uh, There's a lot of Norwegian people living in that area, and that's where the Missouri River runs, mm -hmm. right through there. So he moved there, and he was getting along okay, him and his wife and his family. And in the summertime, sometimes uh, the river goes down a little bit, and you can see the, the people on the opposite bank. And there was one guy there, his name was Clarence. And for some reason, Norway Jin and Clarence got to arguing. Norway Jin would tell him, you know, one of these days I go over there, I kick your butt. And Clarence says, any time, come and get me. Well, they built a bridge across the Missouri River. This is one of the first uh, steel expansion bridges that reach across it like that. And everything was going fine. But when they finished the bridge, oh, Norwegian, he was pretty happy. He'd come in and he told his wife, Today, I go across that bridge, across the river, and I kick Clarence's butt. <laughs> oh, Jules. She called him Julia, Jules. She said, You be careful. You know, I'll be careful. So he went. It wasn't very long after that he came back, and he was just visibly shook. He was trembling, and oh, it was he it was a mess. And she, but come on, soldiers, did you kick uh, Clarence's butt? No, no, he said. I go to the bridge, and there's a big sign up there that caution Clarence, <laughs> seven foot two. I don't go no further. <laughs> bravo, bravo. <laughs> and I guess in about a year's time, he came back to the reservation. He maintained the name Norway Jen. But uh, he was he was a character. He had been in World War II, and he had, had stories to tell. And I love it. He just had that Norwegian accent, and that's how he got the name Norway Jen. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank no, you for the retelling of Nobody that knows where you got that uh, accent from. It just developed. Some, <laughs> maybe somebody in his background was Norwegian. I don't know. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> I knew him well. He was our neighbor. <laughs> so he was a real guy. All this time I thought that this was just like some made-up story of you know, <laughs> random people. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So any other stories you'd like to share? Well, I can tell you a little story about me and my wife. When we first got married, we started buying each other gifts, you know, for no reason. We were young and younger, I'll put it that way, and in love, and we wanted to please the other, so 
we'd buy maybe artwork or jewelry or stuff like this. And then we, a few years later, we started buying each other clothes, you know, nice clothes, but went down from the jewelry and stuff like that to a more sensible gift for us because we were right. not rich, you know, but we bought clothes. And then that went down a little bit, and we started buying more like work clothes. <laughs> of course. But I remember the last time we were exchanging gifts, <laughs> I bought her a, a mop and a mop bucket, <laughs> put a nice big bow on her on her mop, and I stenciled her name on the mop bucket. I thought it looked pretty good, and uh, she wasn't too pleased, but uh, the next day she said, I got you a present. I said, oh, great, that's wonderful. She said, it's, it's in the bathroom. You'll find it hanging in there. It's got a ribbon on it. I looked at it, and it was a toilet brush. <laughs> I said, oh, boy. But uh, I went ahead and used it a couple of times, but I went back to toilet paper. I didn't like it. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's my story. That's a good story. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, wise words of wisdom from Leroy Pelletier. <laughs> well, Leroy, thank you for sharing about your life and family today with me. Are there any parting words of wisdom that you would like to share with us today? Worship your God, you know, the way you see fit. and uh, But just be sure to do it because uh, that's very important. We should, in my opinion, we should all believe in a higher power. I refer to mine is the creator but some people say god and they've got different names for it that's just fine mm -hmm. worship and don't be ashamed of it a lot of times we have to hide our religion but we don't have to do that today you can be very open about it and that's a good thing worship the way you see fit the best way you understand and then again take care of the mother or take care of each other we'll all get along a whole lot better you can understand each other, and maybe, just maybe in years to come, we can start cutting down on the wars between between countries, and hopefully the United States will be able to stay out of them. No more Vietnams. Mm -hmm. Young people, listen to your elders. Elders, be, be sure you set a good example for your children. <laughs> that That would be my advice. That was perfect. So good. So much good information there. And I almost want to write those words down, especially the last uh, couple sentences. Thank you for sharing that with us. I and enjoyed this. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you. High fives. I have. <laughs> I hope that it helps some people along the way. I bet it will. I really I'm hope certain so. it will. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Are you looking for a new adventure? Learn to fly at Chickasha Wings. Right here at Chickasha Wings, we teach people to fly. We've got 11 airplanes, 9 flight instructors, and about 5 mechanics. We turn out about 80 new certificates or ratings each year. And we train pilots who now fly at the major airlines. We have, they fly for the Air Force, the FAA, for private jets. They even have a few missionary pilots. Our customers come from all over the United States. Here at Chickasha, we're able to provide lower costs, a more focused training program, and we're able to provide a higher level of customer service. My favorite thing about this business is helping people because I see people go from not knowing anything about it to being an airline pilot. Come out here and learn to fly. Your adventure awaits at Chickasha Wings. For more information, check out ChickashaWings.com. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Simply search for Native Chalk Talk. That's Native, C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yakoki. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>